Yes. Okay, that's great. Okay, thank you all for joining us today for this 25th talk in our series organized by the teachers group. And in terms of subject matter, possibly the most important. So a few weeks before the IPCC report, that is the subject of today's discussion was released, BP released the 70th edition of its statistical review of world energy. Even in the COVID year, that's 2020, about 83% of the world's primary commercial energy derived from coal, oil, and gas. Successive reviews by BP over the years made clear how strongly our economic systems which seek to expand without end are wedded to fossil fuels. As a consequence of this fossil fuel use since the industrial revolution, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have risen to 410 ppm, according to the IPCC's report, and it happens to be the highest in 2 million years. And it is rising at a rate, if I understood the IPCC's technical summary right, at a rate that is four times faster than the fastest pace it has risen through natural processes in the past 56 million years. The heat energy that's been tracked by the CO2 and other greenhouse gases is roughly equal 20 times the entire world's energy consumption in 2018. This enormous heat being absorbed has already resulted in a range of changes in the different elements of the Earth's systems, which is presented in detail in the latest IPCC report. Volume one of each of its six reports, after all, brings together in one place all the significant peer-reviewed oh. literature, innumerable facets, physical science and climate change. I, you will the things I wrote the, about the ah, last IPCC report in the EPW 2014, I said oh, I wish yeah. such combinations. Could I request everyone to kindly? I could I request everyone again to kindly mute. Uh, while the meeting is on until after uh, until after the speakers speak. Especially Vijay Kumar, his mic was open. Mr. Vijay Kumar? Yeah, could uh, Chirag, I think you made your course. Could you just, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm really sorry about that. I'm going to just go back maybe a line or two and just said that this enormous heat I referred to uh, being absorbed by the earth systems has already resulted in a range of changes in different elements of the earth systems presented in painstaking detail in the latest IPCC report. And volume one of this report and all the earlier five reports brings together in one place all the significant peer-reviewed literature. I think this one goes up to Jan 2021. Mm -hmm. New facets of the physical science of climate change. And in a piece I wrote in the EPW about the last IPCC report in 2015, I said I wished how such compilations were also available for political science, sociology, economics, etc., because they would be invaluable for students and teachers of those disciplines. So to share and explain the key findings of the IPCC report and its implications for our region in particular, we are very fortunate to have with us today Dr. R. Krishnan. Dr. Krishnan is a coordinating lead author of chapters in the report. He's at the Center for Climate Change Research at IIT in Pune. And he and his colleagues there developed India's first Earth system model, which contributed to this IPCC 6 assessment report. He is coordinating lead of this chapter on the water cycle and the co-author of its technical summary. I might also add that he's one of India's foremost experts on the monsoon and also lead author of a landmark report brought out last year in June by IITM Pune on climate assessment in the Indian region. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan. The IPCC report also deploys five shared socio-economic pathways going forward in the 21st century. It discusses net zero emissions and other things, which has attracted so much attention over at least the last one year. These issues have a bearing not just on technological development and crisis, but also on development trajectories with very clear policy implications, both globally and for India. And we're fortunate to have with us today, Dr. D. Raghunandan, who has analyzed and written on these issues for the last 30 years. Dr. Raghunandan is with the Delhi Science Forum and former president of the All India People's Science Network, AIPSN. He has studied international and domestic climate policy ever since the Rio summit of 92, and he currently leads AIPSN's climate campaign and is convener of its environment and development desk. Just a few words about us, the organizers, and about the format of the meeting. This meeting has been organized by Teachers Against the Climate Crisis, which was formed in September 2019. It is a non-party and non-funded group of college and university teachers across India and a few abroad as well. And we've sort of got various subgroups and so on. And we've also organized a series of talks, which is on 
our YouTube channel uh, and which will be made accessible, the link will be made accessible later. And finally, the format, each speaker will speak for about 15, 20 minutes and followed by a question and answer. So please put your questions and comments in the chat box. And uh, you can also ask your questions verbally, but I would request you to just indicate that in the chat box so we can follow the chronology of those who are asking queries or comments and feel, please feel free to do so. So thank you once again, both Dr. Krishnan and Raghu and over to you, Dr. Krishnan. Naga, I want to appeal to everyone to mute everyone. Babu Rao Kalpala is not mute. So your voice okay, is like going. Just one moment. Yeah, one uh, request. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to mute everyone. Uh, and uh, uh, the speakers, please unmute yourself. I'm just going to mute everyone in the call right now. Please go ahead, Dr. Krishnan. Thank you. I think you have to unmute yourself. Dr. Krishnan, you're muted, yep. maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Is my screen visible? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nagraj, for this uh, invitation uh, to, the, uh, to give a talk in the teachers against the climate crisis. And um, also nice to see Professor Raghunand and Dr. Chirag. It's an important opportunity. So today's uh, talk, I will, uh, the, as uh, Dr. Nagraj has introduced about the IPCC assessment report, and about the unprecedented rate at which the CO2 emissions have been happening and the rate at which the planet has warmed. Um, we have warmed almost uh, 1 point, uh, 1 degree since the uh, since 1850 to 9, 1900. And, uh, and the human influence has warmed the climate system. This is one of the important uh, messages from the SPM in the, uh, in the AR6 report. Human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that at a rate that is unprecedented, at least in the last 2,000 years we know. And um, and also, if you look at the multi-century period, this is the warmest century in the last 100,000 years. That is what is shown in the first figure. And uh, this is also based on the assessments from the IPCC from the CMIP six models. Uh, and the second point I want to convey is, and this is all relative to 1850 to 1900 period based on the observed records. And the change in the global temperature, the annual average, um, what is observed from the 1850 is shown by the black line. And you have the uh, simulations from the coupled models, the CMIP-6 coupled models, more than 50 models have participated in this. And uh, IATM Earth System model has also participated in this uh, CMIP-6 and contributed to the AR-6. If you can see this observed warming that we have seen, the rapid rise in the temperature since the 1950s, very clear rise, that you can explain only when you have, uh, when you incorporate the effects of this um, increased carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases, and so on. And uh, if you had only the natural uh, variations, uh, for example, like the volcanic forcing, because when I'll come to this point, uh, volcanic eruptions can throw a lot of uh, sulfate, uh, sulfur dioxide and sulfate emissions, which can go into the stratosphere and they can cool uh, for a couple of years. And you can see some of those signatures, for example, the Pinatubo, which happened in 1991, 92, there was a cooling. And uh, also you can see the El Chichan sometime around 1980s, uh, 1983, and uh, this is the Mount Agang. So these eruptions, these are natural uh, forcings and uh, they can produce some cooling. Uh, but in addition to this, uh, human emissions of uh, anthropogenic aerosols, uh, sulfate, uh, organic carbon, black carbon, and they can also, uh, they are known as aerosols in the literature. They tend to cool the cool the atmosphere and the surface, um, oppose the greenhouse gas warming. But the main point that I want to tell is uh, the first it shows that the the rate at which the observed warming has happened can be explained only if you include the effect of the greenhouse gases. Um, so the second point is it's unequivocal that human 
influences warm the atmosphere, land, ocean, and land. It's not just the atmosphere, all the components of the climate system. And these have had effect widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, even the ice, ice part of the earth system and the biosphere have occurred. That's another powerful statement. And uh, the warming, this, another important message I want to convey is because I want to focus my talk on the water cycle and the monsoons, uh, where it's not only the greenhouse gases which try to warm, uh, it's also masked by the aerosol cooling. Uh, as I said, the emissions uh, uh, due to industrial activities, due to vehicular activities, a lot of sulfate and other emissions, organic carbon. And uh, so they have been emitted and they have tried to kind of offset the greenhouse gas warming. So the, uh, uh, the detection attribution part in the ER6 is one of the very innovative components. Even at regional scale, and every chapter has a detection attribution, um, both for the historical period and the future. Uh, so what it says is if you had only greenhouse gases, uh, GHG forcing, the warming would have been about 1.5 degrees. The observed warming is about 1.1. So it is being offset by aerosols by about 0.4 or so minus. And um, so it, this gives the breakdown. So this is an important message because this will be important for understanding the, the monsoons, the aerosol cooling. Next slide. And the other part is the region. Uh, re climate change is affecting every region of the earth in, in, in multiple ways. And these changes, the changes will experience, will the changes we experience will increase with further warming. So there's a strong regional attribution. Uh, that is also an important component of the AR6. Uh, and uh, with uh, yeah, just a minute. This is kind of going. With every increment of global warming, changes get larger in regional mean temperature. So this is a regional thing: mean temperature, precipitation, and soil moisture. Uh, so regions are good. For example, if you see at one degree warming. Uh, with a one degree global warming, this is which, which is presently what we are seeing. Uh, you can see much of the warming is the observed change, mostly in the high latitudes and the polar regions. And this is what is simulated by the, the CMIP-6 models. Pretty much what is seen in the observation, these models are able to capture the non-uniform nature of the, the surface temperature increase. And what it says is in the future with the, an increment, for example, if the warming instead of one degree, if it was one and a half degree, you can see the, the pattern of warming. Again, it's, it's very pronounced in the high and the mid, uh, polar high latitudes and the polar regions also in the mid latitudes. At a two degree warming, uh, at a two degree global warming, again, the regional signatures are standing out. At four degree global warming, you can see a very, very substantial increases in the regional uh, uh, the temperature increase, a warming, and uh, and if you see the precipitation change, um, just a minute, um, the increases in the precipitation with increased warming at one and a half degree, you 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 do see precipitation increases in the high latitude and mid latitude. The monsoons over the Indian region are also this is over Indian region the precipitation is increasing, and also over the African West African region and also the equatorial uh, eastern and central pacific many areas in the, in the subtropics um, and also the mediterranean region they tend to dry out because it's not just uh, when the water when the temperature increases usually the water vapor increases uh, with every 1 degree warming the uh, atmospheric water vapor increases by about 7% and uh, so with increased um, water vapor, you tend to get more precipitation, particularly heavy precipitation can increase. I will come to that. But over the subtropical areas, even though water vapor may increase, there is uh, a kind of subsidence because the, uh, the, the equatorial areas, the tropical areas, the monsoonal areas, the uh, precipitation is going to intensify and it is going to sink in the subtropics. That's why the Mediterranean and other areas are going to dry out. So drying in those areas will become pronounced. And uh, when we look at the soil moisture changes, uh, you can see that uh, where we, whereas areas in the, in the monsoon areas and the West Africa, India, South Asia, there is more precipitation. 
the subtropical areas tend to get uh, more uh, suppressed. Uh, the aridity conditions will increase. And uh, just mind you, because in the future, the temperature will be higher and uh, there will be more evaporative demand. So the soil will also evaporate and it will dry out. So that is, uh, that is one point. Um, so when I say the precipitation increases, uh, mean, mean precipitation will increase, but also the variability. One important part, you have to remember that the variability in the precipitation will also be large with increased warming. So which means that uh, heavy precipitation increase will, will increase, whereas droughts will also increase. That we have to keep in both sides, the, the precipitation changes will happen. And uh, the other component is for the observed changes in the temperature extremes, when the mean temperature in, uh, increases, heat waves will also increase, what we call as the hot extremes. And, over, and this is nicely captured in the, in the AR6 in the form of triangles uh, uh, fitted for, for different regions of the globe. And over South Asia, you can see the temperature is already increased. This is the observed change. And when you see three dots, that means it is a high confidence. And the models are able to attribute that. And uh, in many areas, you can see uh, there is a high confidence in the temperature increase. Uh, this is for the present extremes. I mean, these are the increase in the extreme temperatures. And these are the observed changes in the heavy precipitation. Over South Asia, we do see increases in the heavy, uh, heavy precipitation. And you see it's daily and sub-daily time scales. Um, heavy precipitation events have increased. And they typically happen at about 7 very much similar to the water vapor increase, something like 7% per year, per degree warming, sorry. And, uh, and when you see, of course, the confidence is limited. Uh, it is not a high confidence. You can see a single dot for South Asia, uh, South Asia. And there are, of course, many areas because of lack of observations, limited data or literature, uh, the, uh, the change in the, the increase in the extreme precipitation, we have limited confidence, have low confidence because of data, lack of data. And, uh, but in many areas, we are also seeing that observed pre extreme precipitations are increased. And uh, so, as I said, uh, with regard to, so when the temperatures are uh, increasing and precipitation changes are increasing bo in both ways, it either it, heavy precipitation are increasing or droughts are increasing, what we find is it will increase the probability of agricultural droughts. And this we particularly see over the Mediterranean region. This is one of the regions where I said the sinking motion is happening. So the regional droughts already they are increasing, and there are also other regions uh, in the globe, uh, particularly the subtropical areas, West Central Asia, Mediterranean region, where the droughts can increase. Uh, this is in the present, and in the future they are further uh, they are projected to increase further. Next slide. And uh, this is for the future projection. Uh, the global mean, as uh, Dr. Nagraj was telling, we have five scenarios, uh, what is known as the SSP 119, 126, 245, 370, and 585. 119 is a very low emission scenario. And, uh, uh, and the, one, uh, the 126 is a low emission scenario. And the 245 is a kind of a midway. Um, and the 585 and 3770 uh, are very high emission scenarios. So in the high emission scenario, the global uh, temperature, uh, the global mean temperature is projected. This is from the multiple models, multiple CMIP6 models, it's not one. So when we show the range, it is shown by the, the shading uh, in pink color. Uh, the maximum, uh, the mean of the multi-model um, multi mean is more than, it's close to 4.5, 4.6 degrees relative to 1850 to 1900. And um, with the SSP 245, we can see that already we are crossing two degrees. We are close to three degrees, uh, 2.5, 2.6. And um, so uh, only we are uh, the two degree, we are able to, by end of the 21st, uh, by end of 2100, two degrees avoided only in the two scenarios, SSP 126, the mean, uh, the multimodal mean and SSP 119. And uh, so these are the warming projections in the form of a table for the near term, that is 2021, 2040, midterm 2041 to 2060, 
and long term 2081 to 2100. Um, so the, the best estimate in the low emission scenario is about 1.4 and presently it is 1.1. Uh, I you should keep that in mind. And, um, and the, and the midterm estimate is uh, even um, uh, the midterm uh, estimate is around uh, 1.6 in this um, uh, because on the very likely range it is between 1.2 to 2.0 and uh, so we are very likely to cross the uh, one and a half degree warming in the next 20 years that is one message and if you go to the 245 this is the the, the middle of the road uh, pathway. So by uh, by mid century we will have a. Um, so the uh, by end of this long term we will have a warming. Best estimate is about 2.7 degree by end of this uh, century the warming rate, and by the mid century we will cross the two degree according to the SSP two point uh, two four five. And what does it mean? This is uh, that is the global signature. So with that, the frequency of uh, projected changes in the extreme temperatures are going to increase. What does that mean? For example, an event that was happening once uh, in the historical period, that is 1850 to 1900, at one degree, now we are seeing those type of very hot, hot extremes. Um, something like two and a half, the 2.8 times it has increased. And in a 1.5 degree uh, uh, warming, that will increase the probability of that occurrence will increase to 4.1 times. And with the further for, for a half a degree increase in the global warming at two degrees, it will increase 5.6 times. Uh, so these hot extremes are going to becoming uh, more frequent and more severe. And uh, these are 10 day, 10 year events. And, um, and at four degree, the, it is the probability will increase by 9.4 times it's more likely to occur. And when you look at 50 year events, 50 year events are more, the intensity of those events are stronger compared to the 10 year events. And um, so an event that occurs one uh, in the present day, uh, in the pre-industrial, what was happening once will occur 4.8 times now. And in the 1.5 degree, it will increase to 8.6. And with two degree, it's going to increase 13.8 times. So with increasing global mean, the regional temperature extremes are going to increase. This is one very powerful uh, message. How about uh, heavy precipitation events? These are on daily and sub-daily timescales. We see during the monsoon season, many areas in India are also experiencing very heavy rainfall. Uh, this year, for example, Mahabaleshwar, we got a, in a day something like 60 centimeters of rain. And of course, they have, they have been happening in the historical period, but these type of events are going to increase in the future. And uh, with increasing warming, as I said, water vapor increases by 7% per degree warming. Uh, likewise, heavy precipitation also increases at the same rate. And uh, <clears throat> so what we are seeing uh, now, what is going to occur at one degree at 1.3 times compared to the pre-industrial time, at two degree, it will occur at 1.7 times, this type of heavy, 10-year uh, heavy precipitation event. And uh, similarly, droughts, uh, agricultural or ecological droughts, a typical examples of the Mediterranean and other places, where we see the frequency and intensity of the agricultural droughts will also increase with warming. So that is one important uh, message. And as I said, uh, I was, uh, Dr. Nagraj said, I was associated as a CLA, involved as a CLA in the water cycle chapter. Uh, and uh, we have uh, about 13 lead authors, three coordinating lead authors. And uh, we have two chapter scientists, uh, one from India, my colleagues, uh, Sabin. And, um, and con I mean, there are contributing authors, about, uh, about something like 48 contributing authors. And what... Uh, I'll focus on the monsoons. Uh, we all just, yeah. In the in the water cycle chapter, we have uh, assessed the water stores, and uh, this is just to give a schematic. And there are different components. If you see, now, almost 97, 97 percent of the, the the available water comes from the ocean, and uh, that is close to 96.58 percent. Mostly, it's saline water. It's not usable. 
And uh, if you look at the freshwater, the, and uh, about 1.61% is in the form of saline groundwater, again, not usable. And what we have used, uh, the available freshwater is only, is about 1.8% in the surface. That's what is available. And uh, out of that 1.8%, which is in the form of uh, glaciers, ice sheet, seasonal snow, uh, which is not really accessible, what is really accessible is fresh groundwater, some permafrost, fresh lakes that really contributes to only about 3% of the available terrestrial freshwater. So the freshwater away is a very, very rare commodity. So with climate change, how it is going to, going to change and, uh, and with the increasing population demand. So water availability is going to be one of the important issues, which is assessed in our chapter. And also the exchange of, when we say water, uh, water, wave, uh, water cycle changes, this is the exchange of water in its different forms in, in uh, liquid, solid, and gas across the different components of the earth system. And uh, what we, the main source of the precipitation, I mean, the water vapor flux is from the ocean through the evaporation of ocean. That is the dominant contribution that uh, leads to also contributes to pre precipitation over the ocean. It's also transported to land areas. It leads to precipitation over land. And there's also evaporation from the land and from the ice and from the, from the ground. Uh, but the important component, is, and there's also discharge of the land precipitation into the oceanic regions. And all this is assessed in our chapter. The point I want to drive home is the evaporation as the, uh, the, the global temperatures increase and the oceans warm, evaporation from the ocean is also going to increase. And uh, this can feed uh, precipitation, particularly for the monsoon regions. This becomes an important issue because the Indian, Indian region is surrounded by oceans and uh, there is a lot of evaporation during the monsoon season which brings water vapor to the oceans and feeds the monsoon precipitation. And uh, this is the broad outline of our chapter um, uh, on the water cycle. Uh, I'll just focus on the, we have an, uh, uh, in section 8.2, we have a, theor a theoretical basis why water cycle changes are e expected with climate change. And we have also looked at the observed changes, what has happened and can be attributed to uh, human induced climate change and what are the future projections. So section three and four, uh, they go parallel. And um, we have also a section on what are our limits to predicting water cycle changes due to internal variability, nonlinearities in the system. There's also a section on the potential abrupt changes in the water, uh, water cycle changes, for example, due to collapse of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation or the Amazon uh, deforestation of the Amazon rainforest and so on. And, uh, and there are different topics. We have covered evapotranspiration, water cycle intensity, uh, the tropical rain belts, monsoons, and so on, as uh, runoff, stream flow, flooding, uh, soil moisture, aridity, droughts, water vapor in its transport. I will focus on the monsoons um, that is uh, close to my heart, also very relevant to the policy. Uh, this is a schematic of the Indian monsoon. We get the rainfall, uh, much of the seasonal rainfall uh, during the June, July, August, September, once most part of India. About 80% of the rainfall, annual rainfall is received these, during these four months. And uh, these winds from the high pressure uh, region, from the subtropical Indian Ocean, from the high pressure, the winds as they blow towards the low pressure region in the, or the Indian land, uh, land mass, they, they pick up the moisture. There is a lot of evaporation from the oceans and the winds also lead to evaporation. And uh, the, so the, the, uh, the moisture laden winds, when they hit upon the, the mountains in the Western Ghats and also the Burmese mountains, uh, they also form clouds. This warm air that rises form clouds and the clouds are, so when the water vapor condenses into clouds, it releases uh, the latent heat of condensation, which again intensifies the monsoon circulation. And um, so there is a feedback between this uh, circulation and uh, precipitation that leads to, that's important for the monsoon. Uh, of course, the, for the monsoon to happen, uh, the land gets warmer in the pre-monsoon months and the elevated Tibetan plateau and so on. And whereas the oceans having a uh, heat, higher heat capacity, they tend to warm slowly. And this leads to a kind of temperature gradient, the land-sea contrast that is important for triggering, setting up the monsoon 
but eventually as the winds develop uh, they produce clouds and there's an interaction between the clouds and the circulation which which maintains the monsoon and uh, and then the monsoons are affected by external uh, when i say i mean other uh, sources like the sources of internal variability like el nino southern oscillation so whenever there is an el nino in the pacific ocean normally the monsoon rainfall over india is suppressed uh, because it kind of the air tends to sink over india and uh, monsoon is inhibited so there are other drivers which can affect uh, the indian monsoon climatic drivers and uh, now the question is what is human uh, climate change doing to it as i said there are two drive one important uh, human uh, cause drivers one is the greenhouse gases they tend to warm the uh, the surface by trapping the radiation the long wave radiation the carbon dioxide methane and so on and uh, and with increasing temperatures more evaporation more water vapor in the atmosphere which will favor precipitation and uh, and then on the other hand the aerosol emissions these are suspended particles these are relatively short lived unlike the greenhouse gases but their uh, regional spatial gradients can be quite large and uh, for example like sulfate or uh, or organic carbon or black carbon and um, these type of suspended particles in the in the lower atmosphere they can uh, reduce the incoming solar radiation from the sun and uh, they can perturb the 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 uh, temperature gradients and they can affect your precipitation patterns so aerosols generally tend to cool and they have dominated mostly the emissions from north america europe asia they have tend to they have dominated the northern hemisphere land regions and they have masked the cooling due to greenhouse gases that's one important message and now this important paper by uh, bonfields uh, they looked at the fingerprints of the greenhouse gases and aerosols and what they find is the, this is the temperature signal fingerprint due to the greenhouse gases you can see the warming substantially over the polar regions high latitude mid latitude the warming signal everywhere whereas the aerosol kind of trying to cool mostly the la areas in the northern hemisphere uh, preferentially that's where the loading is more the aerosol loading and when you see the precipitation fingerprint uh, in terms aerosol try to enhance the precipitation in more most of the areas in the temp the tropical areas also in the mid latitude and high latitude areas whereas the subtropical areas there is more descent more drying and the thing aerosol is a very important fingerprint um, uh, you can see that much of the areas or uh, south asia or the over the west africa or the monsoon regions precipitation is reduced and the areas of the precipitation are increasing to the south south of the equator so we call this as the southward shift of the intertropical convergence zone so the rain belts will shift south so if you cool one hemisphere relative to the other hemisphere the one of the consequence is that the rainfall belt will shift to the warmer hemisphere and where they, the areas where there is reduced precipitation you can have more droughts that is the important message and this has been seen for the indian region uh, so we as i said we have different monsoon regions uh, regional monsoons have been a special focus for year 6 i am not going into the details we have six monsoon regions i will focus on south asia south and southeast asian monsoon um, uh, this was uh, in this region for the historical period from the 50s we have seen that rainfall monsoon rainfall has decreased despite an increase in the global mean temperatures despite the greenhouse gas increase and several studies have shown that this is because of the offsetting influence of the northern hemispheric aerosols and uh, we do see the observed precipitation trends uh, uh, from three different data sets they show a decreasing trend and uh, this is the model experiment show that if you had only greenhouse gases you would have got more Uh, enhancement of precipitation monsoon precipitation over south asia whereas aerosols have tried to offset it and the combined influence uh, what we call as the historical run it is somewhere in between still you get a negative uh, trend so the precipitation is of course there is also internal variability uh, like as i said el nino or other modes of it they also tend to affect the variability but one of the drivers is the the anthropogenic aerosols and similar signatures we see over west africa i'm not going but west african monsoon is a little bit complicated uh, story i will i don't have time for that and 
with regard to the future projections, we see that with increasing warming, uh, monsoon projection over South Asia, over West Africa, also over East Asia, the near term, mid term, and long term. What we have shown is for three different scenarios: the one two six, the two four five, and the five eight five. Uh, with increasing, as we increase the uh, high emissions, when you go to the high emission scenarios, precipitation is projected to increase. And uh, especially in the mid to the long term, we see increases in the precipitation. Near term increases in precipitation are more modest. And this is because of the effects of the internal variability and also the effects of, uh, for example, volcanic eruptions, as I said. Uh, that is also a source of uncertainty when we are talking about near term because we don't know five years down the line there could be an eruption in uh, something like uh, volcano like Pinatubo and uh, where precipitations can be suppressed over the, the monsoon areas. So that's a source of uncertainty in the near term. But when you go to the long term and the midterm and the long term, the GHG forcing becomes large uh, in these scenarios. The, so the response to the external forcing can be substantial. The, so, so the signal to noise ratio becomes strong and we have higher confidence in the precipitation increase. So, so these are the uh, some important uh, statements from the uh, SPM. With regard to the current, uh, state change, uh, current climate system, how it has changed, human-induced climate change is already affecting many weather and climate extremes in every region of the globe. And uh, evidence of observed changes in extremes such as heat waves, heavy precipitation, droughts, tropical cyclones, and in particular attribution to human influence has strengthened since AR5. That's an important point. This is all for the observed changes. And decreases in, uh, in, in global land precipitation from the 1950s to the 80s are partly attributed to uh, human caused northern hemispheric uh, aerosol emissions. But Increases since then have resulted from rising GHG concentration and decadal to multi-decadal internal variability. This is particularly relevant to the West African monsoon context. Over South Asia, East Asia, and West Africa, increases in monsoon precipitation due to warming from greenhouse emissions were contracted by decreases in monsoon precipitation due to cooling from human-caused aerosol emissions over the 20th century. Increases in the West African precipitation since the 1980s are, uh, are partly due to growing influence of GHG, uh, GHGs and reductions in the cooling effect of aerosols, human-caused aerosols uh, emissions over Europe and North America. This is an important point. After the 80s, uh, Europe and North America reduced their emissions, aerosol emissions, and we do see their uh, increase in the, that has led to an increase in the West African monsoon precipitation. And also the GHG effect, the greenhouse gas forcing has increased. So that has led to, that's a policy relevant message. And in the future, with continued global warming, precipitation is project, it is, uh, we see and project, uh, global water cycle is, in, uh, is projected to intensify. Also it's variability, that's an important point. And global mean precipitation will increase. Uh, when we talk about this mean precipitation itself, it is projected to increase by one to three degrees per day degree warming. It's only the heavy precipitation that is at 7% uh, per degree warming. And also the severity of wet and dry events were increased, uh, projected to increase. And uh, that's an important uh, message. Uh, this is, so water cycle and its variability. Yeah, Krishna, and the warmer. Dr. Krishna, yeah. uh, maybe another five minutes, could you? Yeah, just this is my last slide. I'm just wrapping up. So, thank, thank, thank you. Yeah. A warmer climate will intensify very wet and very dry climate events and seasons with implications for flooding and drought. Uh, but the location and frequency of these events, they will depend on also the atmospheric circulation. This is particularly true for the monsoons and the mid-latitude storms. And um, monsoon project precipitation is projected to increase in the mid to long term at global scale. Uh, there is also a, something called as a global monsoon. I'm not going into that. And, but particularly over South and Southeast Asia, East Asia, and West Africa, apart from the Far West Sahel. Far West Sahel is one region where precipitation, there's a slight increase, and this is a high confidence statement. And uh, over North America and uh, South America, uh, they, there will be a, a delayed onset, and West Africa, uh, yeah, and there will be a delayed retreat over West Africa.
yeah thanks for your kind attention sorry if i have taken more time no 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 that's absolutely fine thank you so much for such a rich presentation which actually sort of brought 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 forward just the complexity of 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 the indian monsoon and also and also uh, facets of change i mean in fact it sort of raises question the centrality the importance that you give to aerosols you know not yeah. just for indian monsoon but also then you know what it implies for average temperatures because if aerosols have this much 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 lesser life span from a few hours to a few days to maximum a few weeks then what does cleaning up our act imply also for uh, surface warming you know? if that's already yeah. big reduction of aerosols in parts of the northern hemisphere uh, but yeah yeah so uh, and i'm sure uh, you know all of you would have a lot of questions and i'd urge you to put your questions to Prof professor krishnan in the chat box we now move to our second speaker this evening dr ragunandan who as i said earlier will be speaking on varied policy implications both global uh, as well as regional as far as for india about the main content of the ipcc report so thank you ragu once again and thank you dr madraj thank you screen say thank you dr krishnan yeah is that uh, visible now naga my slide it, it is ago yeah it is sorry yeah it is yes it is yeah okay so uh, yeah so uh, let me start uh, first by thanking professor krishnan for his very illuminating uh, uh, presentation uh, i of course took it for granted that this is what he would be doing so i made uh, very sure that my presentation does not cover any of that ground uh, so i'll start more with the policy implications deriving from the uh, science findings uh, which have been presented both in the report and now so lucidly by uh, dr krishnan so i'll start with this uh, little cartoon that you see here which was published a long time ago in the center for science and environments uh, magazines down to earth uh, and so on and this is based on a poem which i earlier thought was one by ogden nash the famous uh, american satirist and poet but later discovered that it is by that even more famous poet anonymous and uh, the poem goes like this uh, the rain it raineth every day on the rich and on the poor fella you can see them both here but the poor uh, gets wetter than the rich because the rich has poor umbrella and that's what you can see the big fat global north sitting there with the umbrella uh, to protect himself while uh, the global south the poor sits out uh, in the rain and i think this encapsulates what i would want to bring out in this uh, brief presentation uh, on the policy implications of what we have just heard and derived from there of what is going on in the uh, climate negotiations taking place under the aegis of the un framework convention uh, on climate change Uh, so very briefly uh, we've heard all about the uh, working group one's uh, uh, findings and recommendations and this is of course i just want to emphasize that while we talk of policy implications we still do not have the second and third working groups reports uh, the second would be on impacts and the third would be on mitigation strategies which would these two would really spell out many of the policy implications working group 2 for adaptation and working group 3 on mitigation strategies how much emissions should come down how should they come down what are the technologies used for that etc uh, etc et and these are expected only in beginning of 2022 which will be considerably after the next uh, conference of parties in glasgow which is cop 28 uh, scheduled to take place in november uh, very close to now so some policy implications are clear 
from the working group one report, but some can only be inferred. Uh, for now, going by past experience and going by the working group five reports, reports that have come subsequently, and some hints that we get from the report of working group one. So my focus today in this presentation is what the science tells us, the direct policy implications from working group one. But in my final slide, I will touch on some major policy implications that would arrive and that would become clearer from working group two and three on the impacts and the uh, mitigation strategies. So uh, you would have all seen the media reports as soon as the working group one uh, report was released. The newspapers, the television channels in particular were all full of, oh, what a shocking report has come from the IPCC. It's uh, brought home to us how serious climate change is, uh, etc. cetera. And uh, ever since I saw that, I have been maintaining that actually the sixth assessment report and working group one, what you've heard from Dr. Krishnan, it conveys less shock and more awe uh, to me as a long-term observer of climate change. Less shock in the sense there is very little that you can say is completely new in uh, working in uh, sixth assessment report. Oh, we didn't know this at all uh, before. What a completely new way of now looking at climate change for all of us. But we are awestruck by the fact that the sixth assessment report uh, has come between the fifth assessment report to now, there have also been special reports, especially the one on uh, the 1.5 degrees Celsius targets, the one on oceans and cryosphere. So a lot of what we have heard from the working group one report has been anticipated and described in these special reports also. And as uh, the working group one report makes clear, we know as an advance from working from uh, AR5, more or less similar conclusions, but with greater certainty, with improved data, both in terms of quantity and in terms of quality, and far better modeling results than we had earlier, and which Professor Krishnan spoke about uh, earlier. The important thing, which again Dr. Krishnan mentioned was that we have seen in every successive working group uh, report, uh, the assessment report, that the degree of certainty with which uh, various predictions are made about climate change have been increasing. It was earlier likely, then it was more likely, then it was near certain. Uh, this report, the sixth assessment report has gone further than any previous report by stating that the high carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas concentrations are unequivocally caused by human activities. Now, of course, this may not uh, still convince the inveterate climate deniers like Trump and his followers or now Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil and his followers who just don't believe in climate change. And they say, whatever you say is not uh, uh, true. And if you say scientists are saying so, they cross question you to say, who has told the scientists to say so? So there must be some liberal conspiracy going on at the back, uh, which is making the scientists say so. But we know that the science and the data and the models are telling us uh, this. What the working group one also tells us is that by all current emissions control scenarios, medium scale emission control scenarios, temperature rise, which today is about 1.1 uh, Celsius, higher than 1850 or whatever you want to set your baseline at, will reach somewhere between 2.1 to 3.5 Celsius by the end of this uh, century. Clearly exceeding not only the two degrees C formal goal, but also the aspirational 1.5 degree goal 
set in Paris, which said we will keep two degrees Celsius, we'll keep temperature rise below two degrees C, but we will do our best to also ensure that uh, temperature rise is kept below 1.5 uh, Celsius. So clearly by current emission scenarios, we are way over the target. So if COP26 uh, means business, then it ought to be addressing the fact that we are nowhere near reaching the target that we are supposed to uh, reach. The uh, Working Group 1 report also states that the atmospheric concentrations of over 410 uh, ppm now also has very high methane and nitrous oxide concentrations coming from agriculture and wastes in the formal case and from agriculture and coal-based power in the uh, latter uh, case, which will cause even more damage in the future if left unchecked. So it's not only carbon dioxide that we are looking at, it's also methane and nitrous oxide. And this will have policy implications as well. The other important thing we are told in this report is that the absorption by sinks, whether it's in the oceans or on land by forests, is decreasing. The more temperature rises, the less is the absorptive capacity of uh, the sinks and therefore Emission reductions that we target in the future should be even more than what we were saying 10, 20, 30 years ago, because as temperature rises, absorption capacity is getting less. So therefore, our emissions should also be correspondingly lower. And this obviously has uh, policy implications uh, as well. I think two very important things which Working Group 1 AR6 tells us is it busts two myths propagated mostly by the industrialized countries and which have now become almost currency going by the media uh, report. Everybody parrots uh, the same thing and I'll come to that. The first is this myth that we need to solve this by everybody jumping onto the bandwagon of global net zero emissions by 2050. Everybody should know this. UN Secretary General was in Delhi a couple of months ago, and he gave a big lecture to the Indians saying, you should also adopt a target of uh, reaching net zero emissions by 2050. Net zero means you uh, emit only as much emissions as your sinks can absorb. So India will have net zero uh, emissions. And now country after country, particularly the developed countries, are being pushed to say, put your hand up and say, I also will uh, reach net zero by 2050. AR6 WG1 tells us that if we reach net zero by 2050, temperature rise may be prevented, but in impacts of climate change, which have already been set in motion, will continue for years, if not centuries, unless negative emissions, that is, you suck in more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through technology means, carbon sequestration, whatever else, than you are emitting. So negative em emissions becomes very important because otherwise just saying global net zero emissions by 2050 is not going to solve the problem. The second important thing the policy implication that I draw from this is that all nations cannot reach net zero altogether at the same time, which is by 2050. And why is that? Because of the well-known principle of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is called CBDR in short, uh, which means common but differentiated responsibility. That is, the developed countries are responsible for 75% or thereabouts of the total accumulated carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And therefore, they have a greater responsibility to reduce emissions and greater responsibility for bearing the load uh, of solving this problem of 
climate change. In Kyoto Protocol, therefore, targets for uh, developed countries were there, no targets for developing countries. In the Paris Agreement, this was diluted, but the differentiation still exists. The developed countries are making absolute cuts in their emissions, while developing countries like India and even China, for example, are making cuts in the rate of growth uh, of emissions. Uh, so to my mind, the biggest policy implication which we should be getting from IPCC's uh, AR6 WG1, which I'm sure will be made more clear in WG3 uh, report is, ICs, that is the industrialized countries, should reach net zero much earlier than 2050 by let's say 2035 or 2040, so that developing countries can reach net zero by 2060 or 2065. Only if they are reaching net zero early, that developing countries can take a little more time and get a little more breathing space to reach net zero, which may take us 25, 30 years more than uh, what it will take the developed uh, countries, the industrialized countries. AR6 WG1 also states th this problem very clearly uh, using the metric of carbon budgets. Now, this started to be used by IPCC in AR5, and it has now been carried forward and emphasized in AR6. What is carbon budgets? And I must tell you, I am a guilty party to this that uh, my colleagues, Jairaman, Tejal Kanditkar, Rubir, Purkayastha, and myself, we were almost the first to use the carbon budgets uh, metric uh, to talk about equity between developed and developing nations and how burden sharing ought to be uh, achieved uh, in this. Now, what does carbon budgets mean? How much carbon dioxide can the atmosphere hold if you want to limit temperature rise to 2 degrees uh, C? How much uh, carbon can it, must it hold if you want to limit uh, temperature rise to 1.5? This is actually the determining factor for temperature rise, not annual flows. We are so used to in this discussion in the various COPs and so on, how much are you emitting every year? That should come down by 10%. What this report also makes clear is, it is the cumulative emissions which matters. The total amount of emissions that you are, uh, of carbon dioxide that you are emitting, not the annual flows per se, but what is the total amount? That's the carbon budget. And I quote from the WG1 report, which says, reaching net zero CO2 emissions is a requirement to stabilize global temperature increase at any level. But limiting global temperature increase to a specific level, like 2 degrees C or 1.5 C, would imply limiting cumulative CO2 emissions to within a carbon budget. Unfortunately, till now, none of the Conference of Parties COP meetings from Copenhagen down to Paris has shown a political inclination to accept a metric of carbon budgets because once you do that, there is no place to hide. Then it becomes very clear what you are doing and what obligations you need to do. And I think this is the, one of the most important policy implications from IPCC uh, AR6. So briefly about the carbon budget, what we have seen from previous reports from AR5, given in detail more in AR6 is, we, have, we had a total carbon budget since 1850 of about 3,500 or so gigatons, which the atmosphere could take in order to limit uh, temperature rise to two degrees C, out of which 2000 has already been used up. 
and out of the remaining 1000 750 have already been committed by the nationally determined contributions that is the pledges made by different countries in paris they have already committed to 750 gigatons so actually we have only 250 gigatons uh, left not much and if you talk of 1.5 degree actually there's a negative target we have already exceeded it and as many scientists have said 1.5 degrees celsius is not really a target it's already in the rear view mirror it's gone uh, we are nowhere going to be able to reach 1.5 from where we are today. So this small remaining carbon budget needs to be allocated between the countries based on some fair equitable uh, metric. And what can that be? It can only be your per capita share. And, of course, it should take into account historical emissions, but even that has now gone because since Paris, we have stopped talking about things. So, unfortunately, the UNFCCC's and the COPs are stuck on annual flows and that too only forward-looking, not looking at the 75%, which is already there and dumped by the industrialized countries, but only looking at what is going forward. If the remaining fair share of national carbon budgets are annualized, that is, you have, let's say, India, it's been estimated, scientists have estimated, India will need by 2050 a carbon budget of roughly 80 gigatons. Okay, so if I take that 80 gigatons, I'm in 2020 now to 2050, that gives me 30 years for 80 gigatons. So I need about 2.5 uh, gigatons per annum if I want to be able to reach that. So if you annualize the carbon budget for every year, then those annual flows you can look at. Are we going to look at it? Is the Glasgow COP going to be look at it? Or are we going to look at it during the global stock take in 2023 is the big policy question at the international level. Naga, are you looking at me to wind up? <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I'm yes. Okay, five minutes. Are there two or three minutes? Okay. Yeah, five, five, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Two stick to five. Yeah. So, so you can as give I time said, for the there's been much. Yeah. yeah, there's been much movement since the Paris uh, Agreement. There's been pressure on countries to increase their commitments and so on. At uh, last December's virtual summit, 45 countries, including 23 high emitters, did raise their Paris. Uh, announced targets, which were called the NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions. The EU, for example, in Paris had announced that they would cut their emissions to 40% below 1990 levels by the year 2030. And the year 1990 baseline has been accepted by everybody, all the developed countries, except for the United States and some of its close allies who have followed uh, the US. The UK has gone even further. They had a similar target to that of the EU, but have now committed to cutting emissions by 68% below 1990 levels by the year 2030. And these are the two really, uh, the, the horses who are leading the race currently in terms of announcing the maximum emission reductions that they will achieve by 2030. The US, even though Trump has gone, Biden has promised he's come back to the Paris Agreement, but the targets that he is announcing are still a little wishy-washy. And I've given an example here. He has announced net zero emissions by 2050, which is better than in Paris. Uh, Obama committed to 80% cut uh, by 2050, although he didn't say with respect to what baseline whether it's 2005 or what. and the, But the NDC cut, which is the commitment of the US, which stands in the Paris Agreement, is only 26 to 28%. Compare that with the EU and the UK. It's only 26 to 28%. And that too, not with reference to 1990 levels, but with reference to 2005 levels. And if you take the amount of emissions between 1990 to 2005 by the US, that means the US is actually saying 
it will cut its emissions only by about 9 to 11 percent less than 1990 levels by the year 2030. This is a completely pathetic commitment and I don't think they have any moral ground to preach to any other country uh, what they should do and they should reach net zero, etc. If anybody has any discussion with the US and I would urge the Indian government to do so, although I think they will not, is to tell the US, you please set your house in order first, announce a target equivalent to that of the European Union or the UK, and then come and talk to us about what we should do. China has also slightly raised its uh, this thing, and the emissions gap report released by the UN Environment uh, Agency uh, has estimated that where the original expectation was by current emission standards, including all the PA, Paris Agreement, etc., we may see temperature rise of 3.5 Celsius by 2500. That may drop down to maybe 2.9. Unfortunately, that's not a great consolation because we are still crossing 2 or 1.5 uh, Celsius. So what can India do? This is my penultimate slide. What can India do? India's NDC announced at Paris was that we will cut emissions intensity, not emissions. Agur, That's please. emissions. Agur, two, Sorry? Agur, Agur, just two minutes, please. Yeah, 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 two minutes, two minutes. So this is emissions as a ratio of GDP. From 2030, we said we will cut it to 2000. And now this has been found by Climate Tracker to be one of only two countries which is compatible with a two degree C goal. So we should feel fairly satisfied. At the same time, it's also been classified as a moderate uh, target, not a great target. And this can be seen by the fact that this is just an extrapolation of the pledge India made at Copenhagen, which amounts to about 1.2% per annum reduction in emissions intensity whereas India has actually been achieving 23 to 2.5% per annum reduction in emissions uh, intensity. We have announced two targets which are easily achievable. And in fact, if you look at the main targets that we have achieved of 40% installed capacity of renewable power, we are almost going to achieve it by 2022. We don't need to wait till 2030. So for eight years, we'll just be marking time. So India can afford to offer a steeper emission cut target, but we should not do so until the developed countries put something on the table for even deeper emission cuts. And my last uh, slide is, this is what we learned from first uh, working group one, but there are many more shocks to come or awesome findings to come from working group three, and I am just flagging four issues. We have so far spoken only about mitigation, but India is being slapped in the face by climate impacts, and India is not even started to think about any of them. Forget about putting plans uh, in place. Sea level rise, which threatens all our major coastal cities, urban flooding due to extreme rainfall events, which we have seen virtually every year happening in Bombay, uh, Chennai, uh, et cetera. And this time, even in Delhi, we've seen it with 130 millimeters of rainfall in one day. And of course, even if we have 25 milli millimeters in Delhi, kids are dumb, diving off Minto Bridge and uh, swimming in the water. So at this rate, you can imagine what is there. Public transportation, we've made no major moves. Shifting from road to rail transport, we have made no moves. Non-motorized transport, again, nothing. Regulation of air transport, nothing. These are major emission sources, which will also address domestic equity. And the point on methane that I was talking about earlier, wastes is the second largest growth uh, sector of uh, emissions. That's especially municipal solid wastes, which are growing at more than 7%, 8% per annum. And we have not even tackled that in any kind of uh, manner whatsoever. So I'll stop there. I'll thank you very much. This is our website of the Delhi Science Forum. And anybody who wants to correspond with me, that's my email address uh, given there. Thank you.
thank you naga sorry for over stretching my time no that's okay you could just sort of go to screen share thank you raghu thank you for underlining the urgency with which we need to act the urgency which is very much which is a thread through the ipcc report and thank you for underlining that at the end and also for foregrounding the significance of net zero which is something that we've been hearing about for the last one year and we'll continue to hear about for i think the foreseeable future uh now with with no with no further ado i think i will uh open it out for questions queries and comments which you could please type in the chat box and if you can indicate which speaker you are addressing your question to there already are a few questions in the chat box and dr krishnan and uh, raghu perhaps we could uh, begin to respond to those i think there are a couple of some questions for dr krishnan at the beginning there was a question uh, most of the questions so far have been for dr krishnan since he spoke first so maybe he can go first sorry. right right yeah sure yeah. so there's a question from ritish which is asking about how the data of signatures of different components in the air of different regions acquired uh, chirag has responded but uh, dr krishnan if you would like to start yeah. by responding yeah uh, that's uh, yeah that's a uh, the good see basically in the the both in the same uh, all the ipcc assessments are based on uh, published literature and uh, results from the what are known as the cmip models in the in the ar6 assessment uh, we have used both the uh, projections from the the earlier report that is the cmip5 uh, as well as the some of the cmip6 models are also shown uh, so especially in the cmip6 uh, there is special focus on the detection attribution so they have experiments where only you can vary only the greenhouse gases all the all the participant models will do the same experiment all for example in the all forcing experiment you have greenhouse gases aerosols land use change everything goes whereas in the in the ghg only experiment they fix the other values for example only the greenhouse gas is increased in time and uh, aerosol land use are all fixed to the pre industrial values and in the aerosol only forcing experiment only the aerosol is varied in uh, during the historical period in the future projections but the ghg value is fixed so so by doing these dif different types of this is known as de da mip detection attribution mip experiment you will be able to find out the fingerprint of each of the force uh, forcers for example whether greenhouse you know, what is how much greenhouse gas is doing what is Uh, aerosol doing and so on so i think that has been a lot uh, so da mip detection attribution was a very special focus in the ar6 uh, and especially focusing on the regions and uh, the paper which i showed selene bonfils uh, she has used the results from the cmip5 models that is the rcp scenarios hope it answers your question Uh, i this question for uh, raghu raghuram but i'll first go to a question again for dr krishnan uh, which yeah. is from uh, our member raghuram uh, he asks will most of the impacts be geographically limited to the most emitting countries and regions for example will america be the most affected by us emissions while south asia be the most affected by emissions from our region if yes what is the point in giving the pehle aap arguments uh yeah so my my response to that is uh, so greenhouse gas is a kind of it's a well mixed gas the moment uh, it is released into the atmosphere uh, carbon dioxide or methane uh, it gets well mixed and it stays there for a very long time and uh, so lifetime of these gases is uh, centuries of course you see methane may be uh, shorter carbon dioxide has a very long lifetime and um, so the impact need not be very very local uh, for example the emissions from us or other developed countries uh, so since the carbon dioxide emission if it is well mixed its impact will be global and uh, non emitting countries would can also face it that is the, that's the problem um, and but of course when we look at the temperature response itself uh, you might have seen in my picture Uh, the temperature response to greenhouse is more prominent in the high latitudes the, it is not uniform spatially uniform high latitudes polar region those regions the temperature rise is more and um, 
that is because of the meteorology it's it's a, it's it's a much more complicated i don't want to get into those details but the temperature signals is higher in the high latitudes uh, for example the arctic ice is also melting at a very fast rate uh, and there are regional feedbacks there are the uh, what is known as the uh, albedo feedback which will also accelerate the ice melt more rapidly and um, yeah so it has a spatially varying response uh temperature signal in the in the tropics is much smaller compared to the high latitudes and we saw recently canada experiencing uh, very hot extremes right? so close to 50 degrees or so these are kind of unprecedented so and they are also partly related to circulation changes not just the uh, rise in the temperature uh, yeah uh, whereas in the in the tropical areas uh, precipitation responses can be substantial that's what is the, even in the water cycle, we find that uh, tropical areas, although the temperature response may be slight, precipitation water cycle changes can be profound. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now go to a couple of questions, Dr. Raghunandan. Uh, Raghu, uh, you have been asked by Ritish again whether, whether there have been any proposals or technological ideas, fictional or futuristic, he asked having negative emissions. And there's a second question from Raghuram. Uh, he, he says that while India's noise on climate adaptation and mitigation funding by the biggest historic emitters is politically and morally justified, does it amount to anything more than a begging bowl approach for the world's third largest emitter and an aspiring developed country in transition? Those are, those are two separate questions, both for you, uh, Raghu. Uh, for me, no. Yes, and after that, uh, Chirag can come in with your questions for Dr. Yes, Raghu, that's for you, yes, these two opinions. Yeah, for me, no? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, this issue of the begging bowl business, I mean, frankly speaking, I think those days are gone. Uh, there may be some rhetoric uh, going around. Uh, I think the rhetoric today is more in terms of uh, technology concessions from the developed countries. Uh, that is waiving of IPR uh, restrictions, not charging so much because of uh, the IPR thing, but sharing the technology more readily and so on. I honestly do not believe that India anymore thinks that if the US is going to give or the world is going to give $100 billion annually for adaptation, that India is going to get one sixth of that because that's our share of population in the world. I don't think anybody believes that. So I don't think it's any longer a begging bowl uh, issue, although India keeps bringing it up. But it would be worthwhile for India to say, like China has explicitly said, we don't want a share of this money, but we want a share of the technology. Uh, I think that is more important for us uh, uh, to do. Uh, whether it is solar technology, battery technology, storage technology, mobility uh, technologies, these are important, which come with heavy price penalties in terms of the uh, uh, IP, the intellectual property that those technologies uh, come with. Uh, there is uh, there are a couple of other questions for me. Uh, Naga, can I answer those? Or? No, no, Raghu, we'll go Sorry? in order so that okay, I think we'll go, go by some order. order. So Raghu, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, another request, Chirag, Chirag, you said you had a couple of questions for Dr. Krishna. And after that, I might, too, might come in with one or two questions for him. Yeah, Chirag, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Anga. <clears throat> uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Krishna, for that uh, nice talk. Uh, this is more, uh, the first one is more of a clarification. In uh, your slide where you had the fingerprints of GHGs and aerosols on temperature, and the, it kind of went fast, so I'm not sure if I got it quite right. But it seemed to me like uh, the fingerprint of aerosols was a rise in temperature over the subcontinent. I was a little puzzled when I saw that. Um, is it? It, that is near surface air temperature, isn't it? Yeah, it is, it is near surface temperature. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a minute, let me... Let me look at it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're seeing a slight increase in the temperature in the over the Indian region, right? Yeah, 
Yeah. It's so, clean, isn't it? yeah. Yeah. The reason is, see, when the precipitation decreases, uh, the, the soil moisture also decreases. So there will be more sensible heat, so more of a feedback, and uh, there will be a slight increase in temperature. In fact, when you see the, for example, droughts, when you hear of drought, uh, drought periods like we had one in, uh, for example, 1987 was a big drought, 1972 was a big drought, 2002, 2009. So if you see the precipitation will be very low, monsoon is suppressed, but air temperature will be slightly higher during the monsoon season. Mm -hmm. So this is because of the soil dries and uh, uh, so basically the sensible heat will increase. So temperature will slightly increase. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks, but thanks. That is, my, that, that is my impression. And latent evaporation, evaporation basically will try to cool the surface. And uh, sensible heat fluxes will, that increases, that means the temperature is going to increase. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, one other question. Sorry. Should I both answer? Uh, no, the second one is um, uh, just a short question, uh, not a technical question. Uh, yeah. Currently, IITM is the only one that's uh, you know that's developed an in-house uh, GCM. Uh, do, are you aware of plans to do uh, that elsewhere in other research centers, or uh, if that I mean, would you say that that's even a, even something that should happen? It, would it be worthwhile in, from, 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 in, from India, you mean? From, yeah, from yeah, India. Yeah, 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 it would be yeah. good. Um, it will be good if they can, other groups can also, I, I won't say, but uh, I won't say no, but it's a welcome thing. I think more modeling groups, uh, more mod climate modeling groups from India, if they can take part, that will be good. But more than having more number of models, I think improving the models and uh, will be very important. There are, it is not the number of models per se. What is the additional refinement? We know that CMIP models, there are many plus, plus positive aspects, but they are also having deficiencies. And I saw there is one question on cloud aerosol interaction. Maybe I will respond to that. So unless we have a strategy, what should be our plan? How do we re re remove some of the uncertainties? And I, I know in the approval session, there was a, there was a comment. Uh, unfortunately, we did not have the answer in our assessment. Uh, what is happening to the length of the monsoon season? So very, uh, and especially the withdrawal, we don't have an assessment. And uh, maybe ER7, if we have in the ER7, it should happen. So in the CMIP6, CMIP7 projections, we should definitely improve the monsoons and we should have more strong statements on the uh, length and uh, onset and the withdrawal. Uh, there was, in fact, there was one study which was which was telling that uh, withdrawal of the South Asian monsoon, there is low confidence. And of course, in our chapter, we could not assign any confidence statement to that. And we, we could not promote that, uh, elevate it to the SPM level. So these are important issues. The length of the season is one important. So if you want to do that, we have to improve the rainfall processes, the convection, the monsoons. I mean, so many things, a number of things. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, I have a couple of quick questions myself, Dr. Krishnan. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the changes in the Arctic. Uh, uh -huh. Changes in the Arctic are very clearly having their impacts and effects in Europe. Uh, what kind of effects are they already having in India? In what regions, if they are, and how? Uh, that's one question. And the second mm -hmm. one, the report, uh, you know, as you also mentioned, uh, refers to a masking in average surface temperature by aerosol pollutants over the uh -huh. world as well. Uh, what would be the masking over India's temperature? India is warm by roughly 0 0.8 degrees since 1901. But to what extent has the surface warming over India been masked by aerosols? I particularly ask because, as we know, Aerosols has a much, much smaller lifespan. So as we clean up our act, it will imply that we'll get a lot warmer. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice questions, uh, Dr. Nathanaj. So the first question regarding the Arctic. So Arctic ice has been declining very, very, at a very rapid rate. And I think in the next, by 2050 or so, or I don't know, 2040, people are telling uh, the sea ice, are, much of the Arctic will be practically ice-free. That's what they're they are telling at least during some part of the year. 
So one of the consequences, what they, some studies have suggested that uh, if the temperature, if the Arctic ice melts, uh, the usually there is something known as a polar vortex in the high latitude, where the cold air is circulating around the northern hemisphere or the Arctic region, and much of the subtropics, mid latitude, they are cut away. And if this starts, uh, if the Arctic ice melts, then this this polar uh, this cold air which is there in the polar region, they, you could have meanders, and uh, so wavy patterns. And this wavy atmospheric circulation pattern can affect temperatures. For example, uh, mostly in the mid latitude regions, uh, for example, North America, Russia, Russia, continental Russia, and so on. So, Russia can have very extreme heat waves due to these meanders. You are asking question, what will be... So these are typically the effect is seen in the mid-latitudes due to the effect of the Arctic ice melt. In the low latitude, that signal is not so clear. Uh, recently, some studies have argued that uh, if you have these meanders in the, in, due to the Arctic ice melt, it can have implication on uh, heavy precipitation over the Indian region uh, during September. This was a very recent study, 2021. Um, so, so I think we still need, I think it is a topic of research. It will need much more research to substantiate this. And uh, some people have been, so this, some people have even questioned this polar, what they call it as the Arctic amplification. Because of the Arctic ice, certain circulation changes are happening in that region. And uh, there are different, uh, there's a different school of thought um, that doesn't necessarily agree with this circulation changes due to the Arctic amplification. So that's a topic of research. And uh, with, uh, for further studies are needed. Uh, with regard to your other question about if the aerosols, what is its temperature, how much they have the offset over India. See, basically I want to tell one thing. Uh, the temperature changes to any external drivers like greenhouse gases or the aerosols, temperature response is very large in the high latitudes. So tropical areas are very, even, even for example, there is a phenomenon like El Nino or any climate drivers, natural climate drivers, even the impact on the tropical temperatures will be very small because the variability of the temperature is very, very small. So uh, the temperature response will be very pronounced in the high latitude. That, that point we have to keep. So aerosols can offset, but as I said, but once the precipitation changes happen, their impact on land surface, surface air temperature will be very strong. So the direct radiative effect on the aerosol cooling uh, over the Indian region, for example, some over Indonesia, if you take, it's going to be very hard. You will you, detecting, detecting that signal may be very, very hard in terms of the temperature. But precipitation changes can be very, very prominent in the low latitude regions. This is, this is my understanding. So big signals in the temperature you will get in the high latitudes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Aditi, you said you had a question. Please go ahead. Um, no. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan and Dr. Raghunandan for the wonderful talk. Uh, my question is to Dr. Raghunandan. So uh, when you mentioned about how India should be approaching policy making, uh, not just India, but if you see most of uh, the developing world, their primary aim is towards development or geopolitical issues. So how can one sort of switch while uh, ensuring that uh, within the country development is happening? Because as far as resources are concerned, within developing nations also, there's a lot of equity problems and uh, there are other social issues to deal with. So how can a country like India switch from focusing on development and geopolitics towards uh, actually addressing these climate issues which are going to be affecting a very large population? Yeah, uh, I'll try to be very brief on this because I know we can talk about this for hours, but uh, to put it very briefly, see, even when the NDCs were spoken of, the nationally determined contributions, the framework for that, which was set by the uh, UN Framework Convention, was precisely that, that each country should work out a 
developmental trajectory for itself, which will also contribute to uh, cutting emissions uh, so as to contribute to the global uh, goal. So it was always taken to be an integrated uh, idea. That is, you work towards a transformative approach. And everybody now today, whether it's in developed country or anywhere else says, if you want to impact on climate change, you have to adopt a diff different developmental model. That is, social change is as important to bring about this as uh, the climate change or emission reductions that you are talking about. India, unfortunately, has delinked these two from the beginning. India's approach has always been to look at the global negotiations as a foreign policy issue. How do we deal with America? How do we deal with Europe? How do we balance these uh, things? They are putting pressure. Can we give two paisa so that they don't ask us for 10 paisa? You know, and then we arrive at a uh, solution. That is why I focused on those last set in my slide. We have huge domestic issues arising out of climate change facing us, which we have not even started thinking about. Forget about taking steps. Now, if you look at other developing countries, Bangladesh, uh, the African countries, the island uh, nations, they approach climate change from an existential point of view. That is, we will not, we will not be alive. Climate change will swallow up my country or one third of my country is going to become refugees. Therefore, I need you to help me to solve the climate change problem. We have never approached global negotiations or mitigation targets globally saying, this is the effect that we are having on India. Sea level rise is going to affect 170 million people in my country. So what are you doing about it? We have never done that. So my uh, argument which I'm putting forward is we need to bring this integration. If you even read our NDCs that we submitted at Paris, it's all about meeting the targets for emission reduction, which we have promised to the global community. Fine. But along with that, are we also addressing these issues? And even if we are addressing emission reduction, can we do it in such a way as to promote domestic equity in energy. For example, I mentioned transportation. We want to reduce transportation emissions from transportation sector. But can we do it in such a way that uh, more people can participate in transportation? Then today, more and more we are making available transportation for those who can pay. Those who can't pay are left to their own devices. If you don't have a car, walk. But we won't create places for you to walk also because that's not, um, so we are building roads for the cars and for the motorcycles and not for you guys who don't, you know. Uh, so uh, can we work out a uh, trajectory, even in emissions, which will prioritize domestic equity? The same target you can achieve of reducing emissions but can we do it in a way which will be socially transformative? I think that is the debate that we need to have, which unfortunately in our uh, climate discourse at the policy level, this is not happening, certainly not now, uh, you know, under the present dispensation. Yeah, Agu, there's another question for you uh, from Anand Fadke. Uh, yeah, and I also requested Agu to be uh, sort of Succinct in your responses so that we can give time for the participants. Yeah. Don't mind. Yeah, Anand Fadke asks, what is the carbon budget for India and is it compatible with our development goals? I think he says better have a greening policy can be a good way for tropical countries, such as India, as has been pointed by the Lawrence Berkeley Liverpool lab report. I think that came out uh, six or eight months ago. Yeah. Your comments. Raghu. Please be brief, yeah. Raghu. So, uh... Uh, I won't go into the technical details of this, but let me say it's been estimated that for a reasonable economic growth rate, 
in our country our carbon budget is likely to be of the order of about 80 gigatons going through to 2050 uh, now you can cut this cake in many ways you can achieve 80 gigatons by allowing a huge number of aircraft to fly around the country which will uh, uh, in which case you need to cut emissions from somewhere else so the question is what are the options that we use in order to reach this target of 80 gigatons provided we get the 80 gigatons uh, carbon budget of course so my short answer to this is it's a matter of choices there are always options uh, open to you if you take the position that automobile industry is the economic growth driver of india and i will not touch it then that means that personal transport will always remain and then you will try to do various jugglery around that but if you say let me move in a different way i will have vehicles being supported but they may be public transport vehicles rather than personal vehicles uh, trains rather than cars economic growth will still be uh, available but it will be distributed differently then that's a different kind of an option that i think we can go for Professor Krishnan, uh, I think you had a couple of questions that have been addressed to you. Uh, would you yeah. like to respond? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, there, there were two questions. One on the aerosol cloud interactions for the uh, how they can be improved in the models. That's a very good question, and uh, that is one of the uncertainties. Uh, because when you say cloud and aerosol interactions, uh, this involves the indirect effects. Uh, um, basically, point. I mean, which are basically associated with the aerosol microphysics and how the aerosol particles interact with cloud and how they affect the precipitation some work has been done at iitm but i agree that models have huge problems especially in our region the type of precipitation we call them as warm clouds warm clouds are not well represented in the models they are having problems uh, in the way and uh, this is assessed in the chapter 8 in the south asian monsoon i have told improving the models to represent uh, indirect effect aerosol cloud interaction and warm rain process is important we need to do that models are doing a good job but still there are lot of limitations that is one thing second thing is i think there is a related question what about the indirect effect i think that is also related to the same answer you don't want to go and there uh, there was a question on the sunspot cycles but what Uh, irradiance changes due to the sunspot cycles see people so when we in all the semip experiments we do affect uh, we do include include the effect of the irradiance changes uh, due to the sunspot cycle that is very small uh, the kind of energy changes changes in the uh, solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere and surface due to the sun is very very small to really perturb the system volcanic aerosols yes uh, volcanic eruptions because it goes all the way the sulfate goes to the stratosphere stays there for a long time and that can affect your climate but irradiance changes they have a very very small quantity that is one thing um, in fact all the natural forcing runs they do have the irradiance changes that was one and i don't know what, what was there any other question um i think the uh, raguram has a question regarding nox and nto uh, he says co2 may mix and travel long distance so won't there be strong local effects of the ozone hole and phgs including local short term climate factors for example how about direct and indirect effects of nto nox and nh3 yeah uh, that is true uh, in fact there is some assessment if you if you had seen my first uh, what is the contribute globally we have some estimates of how much is the effect due to the uh, n2o and the um, it was on spm1 sorry spm uh, assessment of uh, nitrogen oxides uh, and also ammonia uh, ammonia uh, the cooling due to that magnitude i am unable so it is uh, nitrogen oxides it's it is minus point Two minus point one minus point two, uh, and uh, from the figure, I'm just keep, uh, approximately getting the numbers. Uh, ammonia is very small. Uh, this is on a on a global scale. 
This is in SPM figure two. You can, can please take a look at it. Um, so this is sulfur dioxide contribution is turns out to be the biggest. And of course, there are uncertainties in the indirect effect. So the direct effects we, we understand much better. Indirect effects, a lot of issues are there. Uh, Raghuram, you also said you had a direct question. Uh, you wanted to um, speak here. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Krishnan. That was useful. But because yeah. there are, as I was saying, uh, I was a bit skeptical about this very carbon-centric nature of the whole discourse, which is, of course, justifiable because carbon dioxide is the largest species. And yeah. combined with uh, uh, methane, it, it becomes quantitatively most important. But you're also saying that these are the ones which have a global impact. But there are other uh, short-range local forces which have more yes. local impacts. So, right. And, and exactly as, as Raghunandan is saying, in our bid to please the world community with our commitments, targets, and this and that, essentially focusing on carbon, are we losing sight of the local effects which probably affect us much more and are already affecting us more directly? Yeah. Which I we are completely that's... blind because we think you know climate is only about carbon and our commitments are only about carbon dioxide and IPCC is not even asking any more commitments than carbon dioxide. Yeah. More yeah. So carbon. yeah, my yeah. In a way, in a way, our policy priorities between global and local are getting thoroughly mixed up because of this overemphasis on carbon and complete negligence towards all the others and especially yeah. those which cause all the local problems that we have. Absolutely. I think, sir, you have put it very nicely, uh, Sir Raghuram. Uh, the aerosol emissions, uh, they have a bigger impact on the regional hydrological process, especially precipitation. And uh, that is a point that is also coming out. So if, and a clear example in West Africa, uh, the emissions from North America, I'm telling, I'm talking about the aerosol emissions from North America and Europe, are very strong during the 70s, 60s, 70s. And then there were regulatory norms in the 80s. Uh, they improved the, the, uh, the quality, the effect of the emissions was sub, sub, subdued later on. And uh, of course, the greenhouse gas has picked up. So the West African monsoon, actually, there was a slight recovery. I won't call it a recovery. There is a slight increase after the 90s. It was picked up. It started picking up. Earlier, if you see in the uh, 70s and the 80s, Sahel, the West Africa, they used to have prolonged droughts, decades of droughts. And that is now kind of getting abated. That's a, one of the effects is because of the aerosol reductions in the anthropogenic aerosols over North America and Europe. Similarly, over Asia and uh, East Asia, South Asia, if we can reduce the aerosols, which is possible, which is in our control, uh, which is good for the monsoon. And because greenhouse gas effect is going to continue in the future, uh, it is good for the monsoon, and we have to have better ways of managing the water resources with plenty of rain. And um, we have to improve our focus on early warning systems. Uh, and if you reduce aerosols, uh, it has a health benefits. The air quality is going to improve. Uh, it is a kind of win-win situation. And the second thing is, uh, which is possible, many countries have done that. Uh, and the, the other thing is... Uh, because the cyclones are going to intensify because the ocean seas are, although I said surface air temperature in the tropics may not rise, the ocean SS, oceans are getting warmer. Tropical cyclones are going to get stronger. So if we can improve, and already I think India is doing a tremendous job in terms of compared to 20, 25 years back when I see the forecast of the tropical cyclones, they are doing a pretty good job in the last decade or so. And now, if we can improve, there are still certain issues as far as the intensification of the cyclones are concerned. Tracks, we are doing a good job. So the early warning systems can be improved. And uh, and if that, and then it's, it's basically building your adaptation and resilience to the regional changes. I think that's that will be an important thing for us to do. And education and training and capacity building. So these are the things we should be uh, we should focus on, and also uh, go for energy effective things and electrical vehicles and other options. We have to, um, uh, yeah, renewable energies. These things we have to promote. This this is my broad thinking. Um, Thank you.
Thank you. Sir. So, anybody, thank you, Dr. Krishnan. Does anybody yeah. have any uh, further questions or comments or observations in terms of the speaker? Well, I was just about to say, <laughs> Naga, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I were the government and if I have a choice to cut down one unit of carbon dioxide versus 260 units of carbon dioxide by reducing nitrous oxide, should I prioritize nitrous oxide or should I prioritize carbon dioxide? Assuming that I have only mm -hmm. one of the two choices. Yeah, what I is think locally prior... more useful? I am asking a question. What is locally more useful? No. Can I go, Dr. Krishnan, like to respond? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, because uh, some of these short-lived gases, I mean, they have an. I, I'm not. I'm not an expert on the air quality, but what what I on the are the atmospheric chemistry. But what I understand is some of these. Um, uh, you can reduce some of these short-lived climate forces. Uh, they because they they can really act on, in the in terms of they can also contribute to the reduction of methane, as I understand. And in fact, there is one of the scenarios uh, that is the SSP 370, uh, which is basically related to the methane, high emission, uh, high methane emissions due to regional rivalry. That's what it says, uh, particularly coming from uh, the Asian countries. And uh, so that leads to substantial warming and also precipitation decrease over India. So controlling the, uh, through the short-lived climate, it can have a big impact. This is in one of the scenarios we have seen that, and Chir I mean, Chirag is also doing a paper, I know that, <laughs> with us. Uh, so I think air quality regulation is very important locally. In addition, we can do our bit how to, uh, GHG is a kind of a long-term thing. Uh, in the long term, we have to have a good strategy how to do that. And it's a global issue. And as uh, Professor Raghunandan nicely brought it out, uh, the, there is greater responsibilities on all the uh, developed countries to cut it down drastically. And we can do our bit uh, possible wherever we should do. But improving the air quality will be very important for the health of the uh, local people and um, improving the air quality. And it has also climatic benefits. That, that would be my short answer. Before Rizbud uh, has, has a question uh, regarding India's carbon sinks. Ask what are India's carbon sinks and how do we keep a tap on their road? How much of our carbon is already soaked in with the new mines, plant, plantation projects, etc. that we are already working on? I think in a sense, they, are, they seem to be sort of two parts. Different questions. Yeah, please. Uh, Dr. Krishnan or Agu would like to respond? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe Professor uh, Raghunathan wants to talk about this in India's carbon sinks. I think is, yeah. Um, Raghu, are you there? So, yeah, probably I'm not there. I may not be able to talk much on that. That's, that's out of my domain of expertise. Um, uh, Raghunathan, would you respond? You have to unmute yourself. Ragu? Yeah, I just ask. wanted to say that uh, uh, Dr. Raghuraman has been asking this question persistently about nitrous oxides and methane and so on. Uh, I think he's hit on the right uh, target that there is a value to addressing short-lived uh, climate forces but I think not for the reason that he is citing. The reason he's citing is that these will have more local impact. That I'm not too sure about. Aerosols definitely would have a local impact, etc. But greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide or methane or CFCs, they also have global impact the same way carbon dioxide does. The question is that because they are shorter lived, maybe they, you can get a quicker response by controlling them in the short term uh, by reducing them. Recently, there was a release of a study uh, <coughs> on the reduction of CFCs post the Montreal Protocol, 
Now that started off as to control CFCs, to control the ozone layer, but it also controlled climate uh, because CFCs are another potent uh, uh, greenhouse gas. Okay. And the study shows that it has actually made a significant impact on uh, lowering the rate of increase of temperature in the short term. So my uh, response would be, yes, it is important to target the other greenhouse uh, gases, but not necessarily because they may have more local impact, uh, but for the broader reasons that we are talking about. Air quality, like for example, suppose I'm in Delhi and everybody is gasping for breath because of air quality reasons, I would target reducing uh, personal vehicles in Delhi both for targeting the local impact uh, on air uh, quality, as well as for targeting uh, uh, the carbon dioxide emissions uh, from there. So it's a win-win uh, situation. It's a co-benefit uh, that I'm getting by adopting that as a uh, problem to be tackled. If I could quickly respond to Nupur's question, Nupur, three quick responses as far as India's carbon sinks are concerned. Uh, I mean, if you look at it broadly in terms of forests or landmass and so on, Sharad Lele has pointed out that there's a lot of uncertainty about the extent of uh, India's forest cover uh, in terms of its yes. estimates. So there are very varied estimates about from various sources about what that might be over the last few years. I'm referring to a chapter he wrote in Navroz's volume last year. As far as the forest go, regarding the oceans, I, think, I don't think we can sort of demarcate in that fashion. It's more like a global sink. And I think the latest IPCC report talks about in recent years, the oceans taking up 23% of uh, uh, sort of carbon dioxide anthropogenic emissions. Uh, there seems to be a slight decline uh, in recent years compared to the long-term rate. Yeah, the long-term rate was about 29% in the oceans and in recent years it's been 23%. I'm not sure, in fact, whether there's this variability, whether that indicates a decline, but it's possibly variability. So on the one hand, we've got India's forests, but you know, there's a lot of debate about how extensive they are. And then there are the oceans, which take up carbon dioxide and different oceans take up them unequally, you know, sort of equally distributed. The third part of this is about net zero. And net zero essentially is not about natural sinks. It's about anthropogenic interventions that take, take up anthropogenic emissions. And those two have to be in balance to achieve net zero. So it doesn't include forests, it doesn't include the oceans. But what one does by reducing one's emissions no, no, and no, then no. Reducing one sinks and so on. So those two need to be in balance for it. I'm sorry, I don't know how that answers up maybe the first part of your question. I don't want to take too long. Uh, Anand Fatke has raised his hand for a while. Uh, Anand, do you want to go ahead? No, I had asked two ready? questions at box. Okay. Uh, the question was not answered, please. Oh, sorry. Please, please That's about the uh, yeah about uh, carbon capture by greenery. Okay. Can uh, you please repeat that again? Uh, I think about uh, Professor, uh, oh, I forgot his name from Oxford. Professor Allen. I think he made the Miles Allen. I think he made the point that as far as net zero is concerned, carbon capture by greenery or certainly by forests uh, may not be in the long run a very robust method of taking down uh, CO2 uh, because as we can see from the Amazon, uh, forests uh, you know, uh, could, take, could take up CO2, but then after a while due to excess heat or burning or cutting and so on, it could lead also to its release. Uh, now you can make what you might of that argument, but what he seemed to indicate that actually geological storage of CO2 is possibly one of the only uh, uh, robust ways in which one can sort of draw down CO2 in the long term. And I think this is a point made by Professor Bala of the Indian Institute of Science at a meeting that uh, uh, was organized a few days ago on 2nd of September as well. Uh, yeah. yeah. In case Professor Krishnan or Raghu, I guess you also wish to... Yeah. Ask. Actually, I, I won't be because Bala is the right person. So I, I so my, my understanding of the carbon cycle is very poor. So I'm not the right man. And... Uh, in case there are no further very pressing questions, uh, anybody who want to go, uh, please do so. Otherwise, it will be my great privilege to thank both the speakers. Yes, anyone else wants to go quickly before we wind up? 
Um, uh, can I just make a tiny point, which is also a question? Uh, this is something which uh, always keeps um, sort of occurring to me when uh, we discuss, you know, the greening effect of forest or reforestation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How do we uh, sort of manage with timelines? Because when we talk of a forest being a carbon sink or an oceanic region being a carbon sink, we are already living in a scenario where there's a significant amount which is which has been uh, a region which has been undergone deforestation or even oceans which already have uh, uh, have reached a certain stage of warming. So when these uh, these calculations are made, and also when policy making takes place, when where you know we talk of oh this will be this is this is the aim where we are getting at, we are talking in a situation where there is already a loss happening. So how are these timelines calculated? Uh, I think it's it's a question to both the speakers. In I mean how do we calculate timelines in terms of uh, the scientific calculations and also how do we calculate timelines in terms of policy making? Uh, just if uh, yeah. I don't know if you would like to take. So, uh, Aditi, uh, my one uh, in terms of the most of the CBIP models, uh, they have all these carbon cycle processes built in. Uh, mm -hmm. For and it involves a lot of biogeochemistry. And uh, for example, I I know very uh, very generally I know I don't know the details. For example, in the Indian Ocean region, there are these upwelling areas. Uh, you are a oceanographer. And uh, so summer monsoon time when this upwelling happens, a lot of uh, this phytoplankton, algae, they come up. And uh, so when you have sunlight and carbon dioxide, they can capture these. Uh, and they are later consumed by other organisms and so on. And so there's a big ecosystem happening in the, in the ocean. And uh, there's also other chemicals, uh, nutrients and other inorganic chemicals. And uh, I know that some of uh, people, they talk about outgassing in the Arabian Sea. So, so the carbon, it's a very complex process. So although uh, these uh, algae are uh, capturing the carbon dioxide, uh, due to other chemical processes in the ocean, you would have carbon dioxide released from the ocean to the atmosphere, which is very large. These are all very natural things happening. And... Uh, so when the SST sea surface temperature changes, these processes are also going to get affected. Mm. And also the carbon dioxide concentration mm. in the atmosphere is. And there are so these models they calculate how much is the how much is being captured, how much is being uh, released from the from the ocean to the atmosphere. Similarly, there are terrestrial carbon cycle also in the land areas with the vegetation. Uh, so yeah, so this is a unless you have somebody like Bala or some expert. Uh, who can talk on that. Um, so that, that's the reason I did not want to comment, but they can estimate how much on a global scale, what how it, how it is I behaving. See. And uh, they can estimate what are the carbon fluxes. Uh, but regionally, there are, my understanding is there are uncertainties. You know, yeah. region okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Globally, they have, they have some estimates and they know that uh, with these type of different scenarios, how much of these fluxes will be mm -hmm. in the atmospheric concentration, they can estimate for a different time time periods. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to add one small sentence to this. Naga mentioned this earlier also. I, I won't talk about the oceans. I'll talk about the terrestrial. See, one of the big conf uh, issues in Indian estimations that we have done is that we constantly in our official documents conflate forests with anonymous tree cover. So even in our NDCs, we have given a target 33%. We will, India will aim for 33% forest oblique tree cover. Now these two are two completely different animals. A forest is a different animal and I'm planting uh, poplars on the side of uh, highways is a totally different uh, animal. And they have different uh, rates of absorption, carbon cycle, uh, sub secondary growth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I have always believed that in India we should make very clear our calculations. How much are we talking about forests, and how much are we talking about non-forest green cover, which is a totally different thing because there are different calculations involved, different rates of absorption, etc., uh, etc. Et so that's just one point I just wanted to make because I think some of the earlier 
questions also referred to whether india should adopt a greening strategy more being a tropical country etc yes but greening where and greening how are equally important questions to ask perfect absolutely thank you so much thank you so i would very very much like to thank uh, both the speakers professor krishnan dr raghunandan for both rich presentations and also enabling a very varied very varied and wide ranging discussion truly thank you so much also thank you for all the participants for being with us for two hours this evening uh, and i put the link uh, of the teachers group uh, in case uh, you want to get in touch with interested in future talks and discussions please uh, uh, you can do so uh, uh, from that link uh, and also get in touch and if you are teachers and interested in our work and uh, would wish to engage with us also please do kindly get in touch all the email and so on is there finally i'd like to thank once again uh, both the speakers you know, you know in my view uh, very often comments are made about scientists taking conservative stances but in my view i think climate scientists have done a remarkable job ever since 1990 and even more so in recent years uh, the way in which i think they have made the urgency and the very nature of the problem very very obvious to anybody who wishes to take the effort uh, to understand what it is that they are trying to tell us uh, and i think is now it's up to us teachers group like us to take their message forward to other teachers and to students to enable a sort of more robust sort of response that is both uh, based in science but also perhaps political and influence our development trajectory that may hopefully be more equitable in the future so thank you once again professor krishnan and yeah, yeah. thank you professor nagraj and uh, wonderful thanks for this opportunity and you organized it extremely well Thanks thank a lot. you. And thank you from my side as well. Uh, yeah. And if there are any questions uh, addressed to me which I was not able to answer during the talk, I have given you my email ID. You are welcome to please address me on email, and I'll do my best to give you an answer. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Raghunandan. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Doctor Krishnan. Thank you. Thank pleasure. You, sure. Thank you all. Thank you. Now end the meeting. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye. Bye 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 bye